So this little narrow street here opens up a whole world of adventure. So this street here is, this is Great Turnstile Street. And it takes its name literally because there was a turnstile here that was used to control the flow of people and cattle in and out of Lincoln's infields, which is where we're going. Because before it was developed in the way that it is today, in the 1630s, it was used for grazing. It was open grazing land right here, right in the centre of London. And people could um, enter the, the field via various footpaths. Businesses were set up along those footpaths. So they had to put turnstiles here to prevent the cattle from escaping, but still allowing the people to come in. And that street here, Great Turnstile Street, that's a survivor of one of those footpaths into Lincoln's Infields. Isn't that great? So let's, uh, let's go for a walk around Lincoln's Infields. There are a few survivors of that original 17th century development. Even the, even the later buildings are still really grand. I don't know what age this is. I'd say the obelisks give it away as Victorian, wouldn't you? When it was first developed, it was the heart of fashionable London. And then eventually things started to move west and it was just left to the lawyers because of its proximity to Lincoln's Inn. And we'll go for a wander in there. You'll recognise the streets around Lincoln Inn because they're always used for like filming period dramas. I'm pretty sure it's used in um, The Essex Serpent, which I uh, started watching last night. I might be wrong, but often at the weekend you'll go in there and there's, they're filming something. Ben, Benedict Cumberbatch will be wandering around in a frock coat. You know, that's kind of normal there. A lot of people rate this, Sir John Soane's Museum, as one of the best museums in London, which is interesting, isn't it? It's quite a small one. I've never been there for my sins. My wife's been there. She took the boys there one school holiday and she said it was fantastic. It's basically just his collection of stuff. I mean, he was an architect, so he got his architectural drawings and models, but then there's lots of other stuff that he collected in his lifetime. And actually, the museum was established um, in his lifetime as well. I think it was in 1833. Now, I must go in one day. Not today, though, because, I mean, they won't let you film in there anyway, so... So this is one of the, the, the oldest buildings in Lincoln's Infields, number 66, Powys House. And it dates from the 17th century. And apparently this is where the, uh, the charter of the Bank of England was sealed. I'll pop the date on the screen. In my head, I've got 1680 something, but I think that relates to something else. And there are quite a lot of medical associations around Lincoln's Infields. Here we have the Royal College of Radiologists. More significantly, historically, around the, just around the corner, we've got the, Royals, uh, the Royal College of Surgeons, which we'll see in a minute. And this building here at number 5960 was built in 1640. I don't know if that makes it the oldest building in Lincoln's Infields, but it's certainly got to be one of the oldest. It's a shame that Marquis is partially obscuring the front of the building, because it looks like a really grand 17th century building, doesn't it? What a beauty. And in the centre is this really beautiful garden square with a cafe and there's like tennis courts and stuff here. This is actually the largest public square in London. So Lincoln's Infields was the, was the site for the, the public beheading of uh, William Russell, the, the Duke of Bedford, for his part in the Rye House plot which was a plot to uh, assassinate Charles II when he was on his way to the races. And it took the site that it was going to take place at is Rye House, just up the Lee Valley. So it's, uh, it's actually mentioned in my forthcoming new book <laughs> to be published in September of 2022. There you go, I told you I would not stop mentioning that book, probably from now on. And, uh, but the story of the beheading is that it, the executioner was a bit inept. It took four blows to actually fully cut uh, the Duke's head off and apparently, so the story goes, after the first inept blow to his head, uh, Russell turned around and berated the executioner. I think he said something like, did I really give you 10 guineas to treat my body so inhumanely? I think that story's probably told by the friends of uh, the Duke of Bradford. I don't believe you'd be there being sassy after someone just clobbered you on the neck with a great big axe, even if it didn't fully cut your head off. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's true, maybe I'm doing a disservice to him. So 
But this incredible building here is the home of the Royal College of Surgeons. And they moved here in 1797. But they date back to the 14th century, which is incredible, really, when you think about it. It's also the home of the Hunterian Museum, which is another one of those small museums that everyone rates. And I've never been there. My wife, again, took the kids there. I think it's quite gruesome. It's a series of um, medical collections of a surgeon called, uh, I think his name was John Hunter. It was Hunt, uh, something Hunter, anyway. And they've got incredible things in there. I think some of them might be a little bit disturbing, but um, the kids loved it. And this is one of the many buildings of the London School of Economics, the famous London School of Economics. Um, I nearly went there, I got offered a place there, but um, I decided to go to City of London Polytechnic instead, which looking back at it now seems like a curious decision, but at the time it made sense. I can't remember what sense it made though. The honest truth behind my decision to choose City of London Polytechnic over the London School of Economics, slightly twofold. On the one hand, I got offered a place there to study economics, I think it was economics and statistics, which I had no interest in. I wanted to study like history, politics, psychology. And I could study all those three things at City London Polytechnic. So that was that. On the other hand as well, I thought it, <laughs> I thought it sounded really square and I wanted to go to uni, poly, to get in a band and meet people to form a band with. I, that's true. And that's what I eventually did with my housemates. <laughs> so it worked out really well actually for me. I just thought I can't, I, I couldn't see it happening at the London School of Economics studying economics. Yeah. <laughs> I'll include this because I know someone will ask in the comments. Behind this hoarding here is the old curiosity shop. Now, I'm not sure if it is actually the old curiosity shop of, of the Dickens story, but um, he did used to walk around here actually. I think he's got right an essay called, I think it's called Night Walks and Night Walking. And he talks around about walking through uh, Lincoln's Infield at night. So it's probably the building that inspired that story. It looks like it's being renovated, which is good. It really is just as well that Alpha Books is closed today because it looks like a real treasure trove. I've seen several books in the window that are massively tempting. And I've reached capacity with my books now. So coming here, basically behind me, the main bit of the London School of Economics down there, one end of Fleet Street, and it links us back to that Fleet Street walk we did right at the end of 2021. That's had, I think it's had like over half a million views now, which is incredible. So you can see this is the companion piece. Whether we will link back to that north side of uh, Fleet Street or not today, I'm not sure. We're going to go to Lincoln's Inn now, and then I'm not sure after that. Um, we'll play it by ear. We might head north to Red Lion Square, we might head down to do that north side of Fleet Street, although that feels like it's a comprehensive video in its own right. But anyway, let's see where we go. But just to make you aware that this is kind of like a part of a series, isn't it? And we did a video up in um, Grey's Inn, didn't we, a couple of months ago? So yeah, we're putting the pieces together. other side of Lincoln's Inn fields we have the cloistered community of Lincoln's Inn one of the great inns of court we've been to the temple we've been to Gray's Inn and now we're going to Lincoln's Inn parts of the brick wall that run around the outside of Lincoln's Inn particularly on this western part date from the 1560s that's some seriously good brickwork and you can see the proximity to the Royal Courts of Justice, which is just at the end of the street there. A really, really friendly security guard there in the gatehouse was very apologetic about the fact that it's closed to the public at the weekend and I wouldn't be able to use my big camera to shoot some shots off from the gate, but I was able to shoot some with my phone. Really lovely chap. He said, if you come back during the week, you know, you can wander around at your leisure and also the chapel is open on a Sunday morning. But it's a really great uh, location. It's often, like I say, it's often used for filming. You'll have seen it in any kind of period drama that has a scene set in London. You know, and they're, you know, they're going around in a horse and carriage. It's probably there. I'm pretty sure it's used in the Essex Serpent, like I say, which is on Apple Plus TV. <laughs> and obviously I love the book, so I'm really excited about that TV show. Um, but the, yes, it's one, of the, it's one of the famous inns of court. The, uh, other, there's four of them, the ancient inns of court. Was it? There's two temple ones. Is it inner and middle? 
and then grazing. And there's this one, where Staples Inn fits in, I'm not entirely sure. And it dates back to the 15th century. What, what I didn't realise though, actually from just doing a bit of reading now, is that the reason that the Inns of Courts are here, I always knew it was something to do with the power centres of the royalty in Westminster and the City of London, but I didn't realise that it was Henry III who forbade the teaching of law in the City of London. So that's why the kind of, the legal teaching institutions came this way and established themselves here. Some of the buildings within uh, Lincoln's Inn are very old indeed. It's just got a really magical feel to it, actually. It's not quite, has it got the magic of, it's different, it's different. They're all a bit different, aren't they? Um, but it is a great place, I recommend it. I think I might have some footage, actually, from when I walked through there a few years ago. If I have, I would have probably have dropped it in by now. But it does bring us into Carey Street and this pub here, which is a great old pub. And it's sort of tucked away in the street during the week, obviously, it's just full of lawyers. So it's, it seems really busy here at the weekend. Look at that great old shop over there, A. Woodhouse and Son, a silver mousetrap established in 1690. Wow. Here's another one of those classic survivors of the old London Star Yard here. Classic old English tailors here. Ede and Ravenscroft Limited, established in 1689. And on the other side of the street, we have Bell Yard, running down one side of the Royal Courts of Justice to Fleet Street there. And this enormous grand building here is, the, is actually a Weatherspoons called the Knights Templar, which is clearly a reference to the Knights Templar's ownership of lands in this area. and. Um, the Inns of Court on the other side and the, and the Temple Church. And here we have Chancery Lane, home to the London Silver Vaults. Unfortunately, you can't film or take photographs in the London Silver Vaults for, I suppose, pretty obvious reasons, security, because it's also where the London Safe Deposit Company are based as well. But you can go in there, it's completely open to the public, and you go through these kind of like, into the basement of this building, quite nondescript looking building, and then you're going through a series of like big heavy metal safe doors. And each one is a little kind of room, a little uh, studio if you like, or a little shop, occupied by a silver dealer, a dealer in silver. And it's, um, it's actually in the new Rivers of London book, the new Ben Aronovich book, Amongst Our Weapons. It opens at the London Silver Box. I won't say any more than that. But Ben was saying you can just go down there and have a look around. And apparently the story is, is that that's where the, um, the silver sellers would, sell and silver dealers would um, store their silver down there and bring them up into their shops. And then they just got fed up with it and went, actually, why don't we, instead of hauling this heavy silver up to the streets, every day why don't we just invite people down here to come and browse the silver in the vaults and you can just go in there and buy anything you like you know it's incredible it's absolutely incredible it's a real treat it's a real shame you can't film it but um, you've got to go and see it with your own eyes I'm sure there's probably some photographs on the internet if you just search the London silver vaults on an image search you'll probably find some images of it but it's not the same as actually going down there and experiencing it for yourself all the kind of big metal safe doors there that you have to go through each time and each shop has them as well with the name of the dealer above it it's a real treat and here is one of the buildings of uh, king's college london the famous king's college london this is the morn library i guess i must reference somerset morn mustn't it six weeks or so ago we were in oxford wandering around the beautiful old colleges there and like Oxford and like Cambridge, the University of London is also a collegiate university, hence it's King's College London, not King's University, and it's the London School of Economics, also part of the University of London, I believe. And you've got numerous others, Queen Mary and Westfield College, part of the University of London, Birkbeck College, University College London, they're all part of the University of London, like the University of Cambridge, like the University of Oxford. There are four collegiate universities in uh, Britain or England, in England, what's the fourth? Put it in the comments below. And now we return to Fleet Street to cover some of the buildings on the, the laneways and the alleyways on the north side of Fleet Street, which are largely neglected, apart from a couple of buildings. I think we talked about 
Um, well, we did talk definitely talk about St Dunstan's in the West. So I'll link to that video below in case you think, why is he ignoring all these incredible sites here? Because I made a video about some of the stuff on the other side of Fleet Street. So today, let's continue that journey. I'm going to completely level with you. This beautiful building here, Peterborough Court, I've no idea what it once was. It's a stunner, isn't it? It's a real Art Deco stunner. And I think I've always been distracted by the Daily Express building, which is sort of next to it. But I'll have to look that up and put it on the screen. Just a couple of doors down, we have Ye Old Cheshire Cheese, which is one of the older pubs in London. It dates from, well, it was, there was a pub here in the, in the 1500s, but it burnt down during the Great Fire of 1666, and then was rebuilt, I guess, shortly afterwards. But it, it, it's, it really captures the ambience of uh, an old London pub, and it's where various authors used to drink. Charles Dickens, of course, one of the many, many pubs he drank in. Mark Twain as well. Here's the magnificent Daily Express building. It looks modern, doesn't it? But it dates from the early 1930s. It's a real sort of Art Deco masterpiece. Naturally, a grade two listed building. Made from, uh, I think that's chrome on the exterior there. It really is a real beauty, isn't it? And that's a majestic view, isn't it? Looking across the Fleet Valley to St Paul's Cathedral hey. on the top of Ludgate Hill. So we'll go off Fleet Street now up Shoe Lane, one of my favourite little old lanes. What's interesting is there's so many people around Fleet Street. I mean, it's interesting coming to Shoe Lane because there's nobody here. But um, Chancery Lane, Lincoln's Infields, there were so many people there, weren't there? It's a Saturday today, Saturday afternoon. Loads, I mean, Fleet Street was packed full of people. The pubs are really busy. I think in the past, those pubs would have been shut. It's interesting, I wonder what that's down to. Loads of like, tour groups being taken around Fleet Street. I'm sure that's always been the case, there's been big tour groups, but I saw like, four like, groups of like 20 people at least doing tours around Fleet Street. It's great to see it, it's great to see people in the city. I think I've mentioned before, my City of London Churches videos, it used to be a total ghost town at the weekend and after nine o'clock at night. So it's great to see it returning to, in some ways, to what it once was, a place bustling with people and energy 24 seven. Right, we've turned off. I don't even know actually what this little court is called, but we've turned off into this little court here. And I'm gonna go somewhere that a lot of people were very upset I didn't go to on my Fleet Street walk. In fact, I was heavily berated for not going to this place. So now I attempt to make amends. This is Gunpowder Square. And here in Gough Square, we have Dr. Johnson's house. The great Dr. Johnson who has a statue at the end of Fleet Street there in front of uh, St. Clement Danes. And I was talked about him in the Fleet Street video and people say, I can't believe you didn't go to his house here, just off Fleet Street in Gough Square. And here is Dr. Johnson's house. Dr. Johnson, I think, is most famous. Well, he's most famous for writing the dictionary. He decided, I'm going to write a book just containing all the words in the English language. And he kind of did it himself, mostly. It took him, <laughs> it obviously took him a very long time. We consider the enormous team of people that now work on the uh, Oxford Dictionary. I think um, it runs for about 10 years, doesn't it? That each one, is it every 10 years or every 20 years? They have an enormous team of people. He decided just to do it himself. But of course, the other thing he's most famous for is this saying here on the wall behind me, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. When a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. And uh, as I said in the video before, of all his amazing achievements as a, as a as a, you know, a writer of the dictionary, a poet, an essayist, he used to debate and argue with people and he was a great critic and all the rest of it, a great, one of the great, great, great London characters. But my favourite depiction of Dr Johnson is as played by Robbie Coltrane in the third series of Blackadder. There'll be some clips on YouTube, just go and have a look at some of them. That's my Dr Johnson. Right. I believe it's supposed to be open but it seems to be closed which is a shame because it would be nice to and have a look around. But I think that's the perfect place to conclude 
our walk today. What a, what a fantastic walk it's been. I really do love these City of London walks. They're just, I don't know, they have something really special about them. And I think as I've explained in previous videos in this sort of area, this is where a lot of my sort of early London explorations and research is really kind of to kind of cohere, become a bit more systematic. We start to try and learn it and walk it and understand it and feel it, more importantly, to really feel it. So making these videos for me is really special. And I, you know, I can't thank you enough for joining me on this walk. It's, we've still got loads of bits around here to cover, you know, on the other side of uh, High Holborn. Up, you know, we've got to go up Red Lion Square, Queen Square, do more Bloomsbury. I mean, so much to, so much to explore. So, as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be. If you're, and if you're watching this in the week that it was uploaded which I think probably a good proportion of you will. Um, just a reminder that, you know, I'm doing now blocks of six. I'm doing six videos in a row and then having a week off and then doing another six. So this is the end of this particular season. Um, and it, it's been what a magical season it's been, you know, with the Berlin videos in there. Um, you know, it's been a real mixed bag. Folkestone, the sound mirror, London Loop, that epic Q&A video, Caledonian Road. I mean, what will the next season hold? Even I don't know.